Welcome to LD Disrupt, the podcast dedicated to helping you overcome workplace challenges and prepare for the future of work today. I'm your host, Nelson Sivalingam, and I'll be speaking with the movers, shakers, and path breakers in LD who are reshaping their organizations right now. Join us each week as we delve into the highs and lows of work in the industry to get to the real nitty gritty stuff that you actually care about. Welcome to the first ever installment of LD Disrupt Live. Uh, we're super excited, but like I said, heads up, it's the first time we're doing. We're open to feedback and learning lessons, so do send them our way. Um, today, we're going to talk about a topic that's very close to, to myself and the team who put this together. Uh, essentially, startups can be an unsettling place to work, right? Audacious goals, pressure from investors, rapid rate of change, a lack of processes, all of the above can make startups very, very unsettling. And as a result, it can have an impact on the mental well-being of the people who work in these companies. And so today is really about finding out how and why we need to make mental health a priority in startups. Um, And today, I'm super excited uh, to be joined by an incredible panel. And I'm going to hand over to them to introduce themselves and also to tell me their life story in about 60 seconds. And I'm going to hand it over to James to kick it off. Cheers, Nelson. Hey, everyone. No no pressure. Um, I don't know about the live story. Um, I suppose most relevant to this is that I'm the founder of Sanctus, which is a company I started five years ago off the back of my own. Uh, mental health issues born out of starting my first business. So I've been in the startup ecosystem for about 10 years. And at Sanctus, we partner with businesses to support them in kind of changing their mental health culture and then proactively supporting employees with uh, one-to-one coaching. So a topic very close to my heart personally, and also, um, and now professionally. And I'm also the author of a book with Penguin called Mental Health at Work. And very much excited to be here. Thanks, James. Over to you, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Nice to see so many friendly faces this morning. Um, so I'm the Learning and Development Manager at Bumble. Um, I joined two weeks ago at Bumble, so just bear with me. But I've always worked in tech startups in the UK. So I just left Wheezy, which is a rapid grocery delivery company in the UK, which has just been acquired by Gatier, the largest rapid grocery company in the world. And previous to that, I also worked at Gusto. I hope we have some customers of Gusto here, which is a tech unicorn just valued at over two billion pounds or dollars. And uh, yeah, very used to the busy startup world in an L&D capacity. I'm also a real well-being geek. So I really believe in, you know, work should give you energy, not take it away. So I'm really excited to be part of this conversation today. Thanks, Lauren. And over to you, Will. Thanks. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Will. I'm head of people at MyTutor. Um, MyTutor is uh, an online one-to-one uh, learning platform, and we're looking to uh, improve education outcomes for pupils across the UK through high-quality, so stress-free, affordable uh, tuition funded for those who can't afford it um, by the government. And I've been in sort of the startup world. I've only ever worked at my MyTutor, um, and I've been in there for about five and a half, six years. And I've been on both sides. So I wasn't always in people. I initially started in operations. I've moved across the business. So I've seen things go from very, very small scale scrappy and probably been impacted by some of the things we'll talk about today. And then now on the other side of things, helping implement policies and processes to support the business as it scales. Thank you, panel. So just before we kick off with the questions, uh, you can also join in in the conversation. Um, So do uh, share your thoughts, but also your questions in the chat, and we'll pick it up as we go along. Um, A good place to start is with the why, right? Before we talk about how to make it, uh, how to make mental health a priority in startup, probably good to look into why we should make it a priority. Um, So Will, starting off with with you, why should startups make mental health a priority? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, if you if you think about it from from a purely like business perspective, you know, if you have a team 
uh, that's mental health is supported, they feel like an area of psychological, they've got a, a, a sense of psychological safety, um, they're going to perform at their best. So they'll be able to deliver better outcomes for the business, um, have more creative ideas, you know, drive change in, in the sector. So and from a purely business perspective, uh, from one point, uh, it can just have a better impact for the business. Uh, James, would you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, there's some pretty clear practical reasons. Um, you know, candidate attraction, employee retention, um, performance, it's it's all very important, especially in a startup environment. Um, you know, we're seeing wars for talent. We're seeing the kind of great resignation, as everyone's calling it. So having an environment where people feel supported and that they can be vulnerable or they can talk about the stuff that's difficult in their life and be supported at work is is now, I think it used to be a necessity, to be honest. Uh, it used to be a luxury, sorry. And I think now, sort of post-pandemic or still in the pandemic, it's it's an absolute necessity for every business. I think though more sort of philosophically, you know, we're moving away from work just being somewhere we go to earn money and, you know, we sort of put our mask on and leave our soul at the door. And, you know, I think people want to work in a place where they can feel fulfilled. They want, you know, they want to feel purposeful at work. So, you know, people want a lot more from their relationship with work now. So, um, you know, it, it's a priority for people that's more important and that will mean that businesses are going to have to follow suit because you know we've got to follow what people want and people want to be fulfilled at work they want to feel good they want to have a good sense of well-being and they want to do work that matters so um valuing mental health is is just it's just critical now it's not really even an option for businesses and the businesses that don't i think will just slowly die out probably or not attract very good people and and Lauren, given it's so apparent that your mental well-being has is connected to your productivity and your performance at work. Why do you think it's taken so long for mental health to get on the agenda uh, within companies to for us to have this discussion and um, that it has to be made a priority? What why is it taking so long? That's a really good question. I think that it seems like it's taken so long because the big players in the market haven't valued it as much as the small players. So I think startups actually do a better job of looking after well-being than perhaps some of the bigger organizations like the big four. So I think they have so much power in the media that if they're not doing it, um, it seems like it's not happening at all. I think like James said, now it's becoming more of a necessity and, and that you know, not to be a bit controversial, but that frustrates me that actually now people are doing it because they think they should actually, you know, we're all humans and we think that, you know, we should be looking after everyone in our society. So now it's becoming more apparent that people are doing things because they think it's the right thing to do. Um, and it brings the question of, are they doing it for the right reasons? Is it authentic in what's happening? But it can only be a good thing that we're talking about this more. Yeah. And on that note, um, Lauren, how do we make sure it's not something like you said, is, is lip service or it's being done as a part of a company and employer branding. And it, instead, it's actually being done to drive real impact within the organization and actually to look after the well-being of the people. How do you make sure it's not um, the former and it is more of the latter? I wish I had the answer to that because I'd probably be very rich. But I think for me, it's more about the actual people in the organisation. So it's not about a press release saying, oh, look, we're giving everyone free yoga or like here's an extra day off. I think it's more about the people in the organisation and how they feel. And you will see that through attrition, right? If people are loyal to a business and they want to stay there for a long time, the likelihood is that's because they're seen as a human and they are treated like one and you know their well-being is important to that organisation. And the great resonance resignation is a great point, right? So people are starting to resign because they're not getting that from an organization. So I think that's how we know if it's clear is what's the loyalty to the organization? Why is that loyalty there? And also just real reviews from people. I think Glassdoor is a fascinating place to find out what an organization is really like on the inside. Yeah. Uh, similarly, James, how do, how do we make mental health priority in a way that's driving real impact and not just lip service? Yeah, I mean that. I, I think you know people might people ask sometimes like what works and what doesn't, and, and lip service and box ticking certainly doesn't work. And, and as humans, we can smell it a mile off. Like you know, we can smell when 
and your employees can smell when something's a bit of an afterthought. Uh, you know, the classic is, you know, the CEO email and then like the EAP is like stuck at the bottom or like, you know, it's it's World Mental Health Day and the HR team have like scrambled around like two days before to think of something to do. Like people can smell it a mile off. Like, you know, and we're all smart in a sense. Like we all, we can pick up what's real and what's honest. So um, you know, I think people people have got really high senses for that. Um, I think that the most obvious kind of tracker is, is kind of can be quantitative, but it can also you can also pick it up from just a general feel. It is just engagement. I think like employee engagement. You know, um, if the CEO, as an example, or a leader in the organisation, sends a message out to the company on let's say World Mental Health Day or Mental Health Awareness Week, and people respond to it and people are like, "Oh, thank you for sending this," then there's obviously you know, people can sense that that was a real message from the heart and it actually meant something. Um, so, you know, I think, I think, I think engagement is a really good tracker for it. Um, you know, you can, you can ask your company what's going on. You can send an employee engagement survey out. You can do little round tables. You can bring a wellbeing task force together. Like you can, you can track these things. Um, and really, like you, you've got to tap into a different kind of listening. I think, like a more of an intuitive feel, whether something's working or not, or when it's around well-being and, and and mental health, it's it's more difficult to track than, let's say, the the sales numbers, which are extremely yeah. Um, yeah. obvious. And and well, sometimes though, it is hard to avoid the pressure of keeping up the appearances, right? You you hear. Uh, another successful startup posting about all of this amazing uh, mental well-being stuff that they're doing in a company. You don't know how true or effective it is, but you hear they're doing it and they're shouting about it. And then all of a sudden you feel like you're under pressure to to have to live up to it, right? And and to also get something that maybe ticks the box or um, puts you on the same kind of pedestal. So how do you kind of deal with that kind of pressure of trying to keep up the appearances? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. And, you know, you should probably always try and look internally before you start looking externally. You know, how are your, how are the team that you hired, how are they feeling? How supported are they in this area? Um, and and look at the leadership as well. So what have you been able to, to put in place, policies, processes that show it's true? Um, you know, there are, there are, there are companies that have like huge teams and resources that can build amazing employer brands and get this stuff out. But ultimately, you know, it's all about how are your team feeling? There was mentioned around service there, uh, surveys that you can run. And also, again, policies and processes. Something we've been able to do was build in the idea of building psychological safety into our progression framework. So that's, just, that's how you can kind of get this sense of it is important. You know, if you want to do well at a company, you, you literally have to be able to, to showcase this to move forward. And that's how you can get a real sense of it, is it ingrained and is it working? Um, I just want to pick up a, a question that's just been posted. Does anyone have experience having a, a well-being officer role in the company? Is that something you've you've come across or, or worked in? Lauren, I can see you nodding your head. Maybe it would be great to hear about that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's only two weeks, but Bumble do have a well-being team. So that's a great luxury. That's not something that I've come across before. And from my experience, they do a great job of these internal initiatives so we do have things like meditation. We do have things like, um, like lunch Fridays and really fun things internally that they're responsible for driving. Um, and I can see the impact that has. And Bumble don't necessarily shout about the fact that that's a team. That is a purely internal service for us that, you know, sits in its own team. All right. Um, hey, oh, Will, you had something? Say, yeah, something we've been able to do potentially for maybe like earlier stage companies that haven't got quite the same level of funding is we started the wellbeing committee. So it's sort of like grassroots. Um, so, you know, a side part of someone's role, maybe a junior team member who wants to have a little extra project to focus on, they can come in, focus on the wellbeing committee, have a small amount of budget and they can really drive through initiatives and make sure um, there's lots of, you know, different uh, initiatives being run, posts being run, collecting feedback from the team. And that's been a really successful one for like getting engagement. You've got a group of people who really want to be involved in something like this. And two, like helping you punch above your weight and run more initiatives than you would if you're a very small people team and you've got limited resource. And, and what do you find will works and doesn't work in terms of putting together a business case 
to get that budget, uh, even if it's not monetary, but to get people's time um, and and the kind of resources invested in making this happen. What, what's the best way of doing that? Yeah, so I think you know if you're if you're speaking about like convincing the leadership team, I guess um, the first thing, and this rings true for anything, is you know how do they like how do they like to be convinced? So is it going to be industry data? Um, that people focus on or, you know, survey, internal survey data, you know, this is what people are, are, are wanting. Is it looking at some, you know, um, our CMO, for example, always loves to see what other sort of thought leads are doing in the industry, other great companies. And if you can say, you know, X, Y, Z business who we love, they're doing this. This is something we could go after. So I guess uh, first understanding how people like to be convinced um, and then just being really tight on metrics. So I think there's already been talk about turnover is a really key one, um, you know, just generally key performance indicators, like um, if you can track those and have a good view on them and show progress and, you know, make a case that you'll be able to improve these areas, that's just a great business case. And James, for your book, Mental Health at Work, you obviously interviewed a lot of um, people leaders um, who have kind of talking about their um, tactics and strategy for, for driving well-being and, and putting mental health as a priority in their companies. Are there any kind of lessons you learned around how to kind of pitch and position the business case and to get um, the air of the leadership and, and actually get budget to, to do something meaningful? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say, though, is that I actually think you can build a world-class uh, mental health approach in your workplace for for nothing. I don't actually think you need any budget at all. Um, you know, for example, um, one of the things that I've seen over the last five years is that, you know, one of the biggest things that impacts our mental health at work is the quality of our relationship. It's the quality of our management, as an example. Um, you know, managers making sure that they check in with their team and ask them, how are you? Where they talk about their well-being, that costs nothing. Yeah, maybe it costs 15 minutes of, of the one-to-one, but it doesn't cost any additional cash. Um, and there are there are a million and one initiatives you can roll out that that don't cost a penny. You could create a, you know, you can create a Slack channel where people can talk about what's going on. They can share what they're doing for their mental health. Again, it doesn't cost anything additional to what you're already spending. So I really actually believe we can create really progressive and proactive mental health cultures for, for no additional budget. Um, however, I think there are some stuff that that is our nice to haves. Um, you know, whether it's additional support, coaching, uh, counseling, therapy, some of your nicer, maybe add-ons, yoga, meditation, that kind of stuff. Or um, you know, other, a million and one other things. I think Will's hit the nail on the head. In my experience, is it's about finding the right language to to tell the story. Um, you know, some people want want numbers, they want data, they want uh, they want really quantitative stuff. That that definitely works and is very important, and we shouldn't discount it. However, in my experience, what is most hard hitting are um, real human stories. So if people are able to share their own lived experiences about about what's going on for them and i don't mean you know sort of breaking down in tears and talking about your childhood or your past i just mean being able to verbalize and articulate how work is impacting you right now um you know it can be a powerful sentence to just say look i'm stressed i'm stressed with x or i'm anxious about y and if people are able to do that and feel safe enough to do that then they, those stories can ripple up through an organization and that can create real change from there and we've had a lot of conversations with kind of people leaders recently, and we've really heard, you know, through the pandemic and especially working remotely or hybrid working, the, the kind of mental health challenges have become even more uh, in your face and hard to kind of avoid. But also it's been a lot more challenging to, to kind of roll out well-being initiatives for a hybrid workforce. And we've heard a lot of um, people feeding back on, you know, we tried the initial Zoom calls, Zoom catch-ups, and then there's the kind of Zoom fatigue, and then we were stuck on what we needed to do. So, Lauren, how can you roll out well-being initiatives for a hybrid workforce effectively? Yeah, so all the organisations I've worked in have always been hybrid. Um, so when the pandemic started, there was a bit of a shift, but it wasn't you know, such an extreme as other people have experienced. 
I'm just, I'm not so keen on the word initiative because I think there's, a, you know, initiative to me feels a bit forced. And I think anything that's forced, you're not going to get great engagement on, right? Like we can definitely set up a yoga session on a Wednesday and, you know, you'll get a few people attend because they're interested in it. But if it's something that is mandated by the organization, it doesn't feel very authentic. So for me in a hybrid approach, I really rely heavily on the managers and the leaders of the business. So for me, it's like, how do we encourage those people to bring mental health into the conversation? Because that's way more meaningful than, you know, an initiative that is kind of put on by the company. It's nice to have, but actually it's less important than this conversation. So for me, it's about leading and coaching our managers and the people that have influence in the business to have those conversations and make it a real priority. So before we talk about, you know, have you met your goals this week? You know, it's actually, well, how are you and how are you feeling? And, you know, I know we're not connected together in person, but do you want to go get a cup of tea? You know, and we can we can have that conversation. So it's making it feel authentic through a screen and it's encouraging people to do that outside of that management position as well. So actually, if you think somebody is struggling, it's very hard to know that sometimes in a hybrid world, but we're humans and have a feel for how somebody is through their Slack messages, their tone, their emails, how much they're contacting you. So it's about taking a personal responsibility too and reaching out to that colleague you haven't heard from in a couple of days and just being like, hey, let's just have a catch up about something completely random. Like I know you were going to go do that thing the other day outside of work. How was that for you? So for me, it's giving people the space and the tools and the toolkit to be able to have those conversations in an authentic way. Yeah. And just on that, um, Lauren, what are some of the best ways to, I guess, enable and empower the leaders and the influencers within the business uh, to drive um, the, the kind of well-being across teams? The most best thing that I've ever done is just treat those leaders in the same way, which can be a little bit scary for them at first, because actually, you know, who was Lauren to go to the CEO and just ask how their mental health is. But for me, once you start opening conversations like that, you know, at first you're known as kind of the lady that is a little bit freaky and like wants to know how everybody's feeling. But if I open up a conversation with a senior leader by saying, actually, how are you feeling? Like, how are you really feeling today? And what are you doing that gives you energy and what's taking your energy away? And by opening conversations like that with people that are above you in the organization, naturally, after a few sessions, it starts to click that perhaps they should be doing the same thing to me. So after a while, you know, they'll start asking me, well, you know, you always ask me how I'm feeling. How are you feeling? And actually that has a great impact when they hear that somebody's listening to them. I think being a leader is a really isolated place. And so if you treat them with the same kindness that you would like everybody to be treated with, it does start to have a knock-on effect. And even if it's not a natural thing for them, sometimes leaders will be pressured into acting that way because they notice that it's starting to have a ripple effect across the organization. Uh, I love that, Lauren. I think in the early days as a founder of a startup, um, I definitely used to struggle with talking about, um, you know, when things are difficult because you, you've you kind of constantly been surrounded by this narrative of being a strong leader who's not phased by anything. And that's what people want to kind of look up to and, and see. But we had a very similar instance where I had one of my colleagues who've been with us for almost four years now asking, you know, you built a friendship where she could ask the question of how are you actually doing and what do you do when you're facing these problems? And that definitely does liberate you and and make you realize how important that kind of exchange is so definitely love that um question to you will based on the the committee we've had here in the chat so the question is really around how do you make sure the people who kind of volunteer their time for the committee um really take it seriously right and it, and it doesn't the moment they get a bit busy uh, they start not turning up to meetings, nothing actually ends up happening. How do you make sure they are engaged and you're actually getting things done? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's a few things. One, as with anything, make sure expectations are really clear up front. You know, if they are committing to this, what are you going to be expecting them to deliver over the time period during that committee? And I think that also needs to be agreed with managers as well. So managers need to know that, you know, whether this fits into their personal development time, whether it fits into their project time, it's very much built into what they do. So even when they get busy, there's still time carved out. Uh, another thing is refresh it. So we tend to do it every six months. Sometimes could even just be someone could do a quarter. Um, refresh the team, bring in some 
some new people, some of the old ones leave, and you kind of keep cycling it, cycling it around. So there's always new opportunities and, and a new new perspective. Um, and then the last one doesn't necessarily have to stand true, but we often give the opportunity to maybe uh, more junior members in the team who are looking for a way to sort of focus on side projects, you know, maybe get out of the day-to-day, particularly if you're in maybe a customer-facing role where it feels like you can be doing emails and calls constantly all day. A nice side project like this about something you're passionate about, you'll be making time to work on this. This will be something you'll you'll be uh, desperate to get focused on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we've managed to maintain it and it seems to be pretty successful. And um, James, we've got a question here in the chat, which is, do you have any examples of the kind of questions and KPIs um, you you can ask in the surveys to make sure you're making improvements to well-being at work, like the the right ones that people want. Um, I mean, I wouldn't call I wouldn't class myself as a survey expert, to be honest. I think um, so. Not off the top of my head, I, I imagine there's some pretty basic stuff. You know, um, you know, how comfortable do you feel at you know at talking to your manager about your mental health? Um, I think, you know, when I did, when I was interviewing, um, people from my book, I spoke to KFC and they had one question that sparked their whole, um, you know, sort of change in their mental health approach was, was, do you feel, you know, do you feel psychologically safe in your workplace? Um, and you know, the data they got from that led them to make some more changes. So, um, I imagine you're going to intuitively know what questions to ask. I, I think actually the, the thing that stops people asking the question is when they don't want to know the answer. Uh, in my experience, like it's, it's, you know, we're all, we all know the questions we need to ask. Uh, you know, you could, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how stressed you feel? Like there's, you know, there's, there's a million and one different things. I, I would, I would push that back and say, look, I, I imagine most people on this call know what needs to be asked. Um, and it's a, probably about being ready to listen actually um and, and feel empowered once you hear it to, to actually be able to do something about it because i think often what, what what people are afraid of is that they ask the question people respond and then they've got an obligation to actually do something about it which is true however you know i don't think you have to say right we've listened to you okay here's what we're doing straight away people want to be heard and i think even just by saying like thank you we hear you you know even if you're not able to make a whole raft of changes immediately i think just letting people know that they've been heard letting people know that you're listening letting people know that you're aware um can make people feel better basically but knowing that you care and knowing where you are in your thinking and and you mentioned it nelson like as a as a leader sometimes it's difficult to like to do that and let people into your thought process because as a leader you want to give these polished you know, these polished responses. But I think the more kind of vulnerability and openness we can lead with and just saying, look, we don't know yet. Like we don't know exactly what we're going to do, but we're figuring it out um, can be a really powerful thing because you start, you're starting to treat your employees like adults, not like kids. Yeah. Uh, another question from the audience for all of you is what metrics are easiest to measure and which ones can give immediate feedback? Anyone want to take that? Yeah, so I think Michael's actually identified some good ones there anyway. So sickness, um, yeah, I think it's sickness. And also, you know, if you're in a HR space, what type of sickness is that? So like, is it long-term sick? Is it how many people have we got off with stress, for example? Like hopefully none, right? But why are those people stressed? Pulse surveys, Mr. Gusto did a really good job of sending out regular employee surveys using quite a cool system, um, which would ask a number of questions. The first question always being on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this place to work? Which is like an NPS question, which I thought was quite interesting. Manager approval rating. So what I understand by that is, you know, how would you rate your manager? Is your manager... My dogs are squeaking toys in the background. I'm sorry. Is your manager someone that you want to work with? Um, I think other things are definitely turnover, which I mentioned earlier. And why does that turnover exist? And there's also just business results as well. So how well are people performing? Because if we're supporting somebody's well-being, like we mentioned at the beginning, they're more able to perform their role because actually they feel like they're empowered to do so. And actually they feel capable of doing that. So what are those 
things that we're meeting? Are we exceeding targets? Are we meeting targets? If we're not meeting targets, is it something to do with the well-being of that person? Yeah. So I think there's loads. I think Michael yeah. pretty much hit the nail on the head. <laughs> All right, we're just going to open it up for some live uh, questions. So over to the team. Is there anyone who wants to come up for live questions? Georgie, Kim, anyone want to bring up? I just have a look. Charlotte, you, you asked a question. I don't know if there was anything more, if you had it answered by the panel or... Um, if you've got anything further that you want to know, feel free to jump on. Hi. Or... <laughs> hey. Hey, this is uh, Vinny. Um, so I, I mean, I've been through the situation what you guys were discussing just now, but with a little difference. Um, I worked all my life in India and recently I moved to Germany. So there's a cultural switch for me from the way I used to work in India versus how it works in Germany. Um, um, I'm sorry, my room is not really clean. and I'm not able to figure out how the background needs to be fixed. That's why I'm not starting my video. I am so sorry no for that. No okay. problem. Anyway. Don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's it's been a great deal for me. Uh, I've been trying to figure out how to feel, which is why I put my question there. Uh, there is no culture where I work. Like, there's no defined culture that this is how we work or this is how it is, or at least not in my department. And my department is fairly new, like two years or something, and they're still picking up. So there is no definitive culture as to how people mingle with each other or have this global connection. Although being a global team, there's a lot of disconnect, at least I feel from my perspective. And I've been trying to feel that culturally I am a misfit or I don't know how to wiggle myself into that space. It's impacting me a lot because uh, for uh, uh, literally for quite some days, I, I would struggle and I would feel that, you know, when you were a kid, you would cry to go to school. So basically, it's that kind of feeling. Every morning I wake up and I'm like, oh, I don't want to work. So it's just that expression. or I don't want to go back to work with a kind of expression. And somehow, even now, there is still that for me. Every weekend, I'm like, oh, my God, it's Monday. I have to start working. Uh, I don't know how to deal with this situation. And I don't know a lot of people go through this. Is it because of pandemic or how do you deal with this kind of situation? Uh, Vinuta, firstly, Vinuta, thank you so much for being so candid and for sharing. And I'm sure there are many people who have at some point in their career felt like that. Um, I can definitely say I felt like that in, in previous um, corporate jobs that I've worked in. So I can definitely connect to that feeling. Um, to the panel, what, what are your thoughts? What would you say to Vinuta? Yeah, um, firstly, yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing your experience there. Um, and I guess, I kind of relatively straightforward. I don't know the full um, the full story behind it, but um, you know, speak to your managers, speak to your HR team. You know, if you're saying they feel like there's a lack of culture there, like speak to the people who can help define that. You know, senior leaders, HR, share share what you're feeling, um, share what you'd like to see potentially, uh, and see if you can work together to put some pieces in place there with them. And I think ultimately, if if you are sharing this feedback and it isn't being listened to and you don't feel heard, then um, I don't know what the opportunities are. But you know, potentially it's a different company because I think the great resignation was was brought up um, in this session. And you know, it is a a, a buyer's market in terms of um, uh, looking for looking for new roles. There are much uh, much more roles than candidates at the moment. So this is the time where you know what makes you happy, what brings you joy, and it works, you know, close to 50% of your life or something like that, or probably a bit less, um, you know, it should be one that, that does bring you joy. So potentially it's time to look at other companies that, that the culture does suit what you're looking for and what you need. Uh, Jane, Lauren, anything to add? I just wanted to build on that point. I think like saying, um, you know, this seems like there's a lack of culture is a culture in itself. Like there's always, every organization has a culture. It might just not be the one that we are hoping for. So there is a culture in itself. 
Um, it might not have been refined or shaped by the people that need to shape it and the direction it needs to go in, but there is a culture and you've started to identify what that is. And I'm really sorry to hear that you you feel that way. I think that's an awful way to feel. I've definitely felt that way myself in the past. So I think you know, the first stage is recognizing that you feel that way. And, you know, you can talk to your manager or HR, but I get the sense that perhaps um, you you still maybe don't have that trust in those people that something will happen if you're feeling like you have to wriggle in. And just from a human perspective, like, please don't change yourself to fit into somebody else's mold because that's just not a nice way to live. And actually you should feel that you can be your authentic self. And if that doesn't match with that business, then there are loads of roles out there that will absolutely match what you're looking for. Um, like don't downplay yourself just to fit into an organisation. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, James, anything to add? I just echo, yeah, th- thank you for sharing it and being brave to, to share it with everyone here. I mean, I mean, look, I've <laughs> felt like that many times in, in my life and they're important feelings to, to recognise. And actually you know, the way you're feeling can actually be a really important thing to share for, for the business, for, for the company you work. I mean, they, they might be completely unaware that they've got a brilliant, talented employee that is dissatisfied. So actually by sharing that with the person that you feel comfortable sharing it with, which I think is an important one, you might not feel comfortable sharing it with your manager, but there might be someone in HR that you've connected with that you do feel. And that could be a, re- a moment in time for the company where they realize, ah, oh, you know, there's something missing here. There's something we're not doing. Um, you also mentioned, you know, that you've been working in India and you're in Germany. So there might be some cultural differences that might be very, you know, unique. Um, and again, that might be something that, the company's unaware of. Um, and I wanted to build on it and make a point that, you know, there's lots of uh, lots of startup culture and lots of well-being culture is not inclusive. Like lots of, you know, like a classic startup thing is like, oh, let's make all the employees happy by doing like pizza and beer. You know, that's the classic. Let's get a load of pepperoni pizzas and beer in which completely discounts like people that don't drink for like religious or health reasons, people that, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I think you sharing that story in a place that you feel safe in the company can be a real, um, could spark some cultural change. It might not, if you're not listened to, then yeah, you know, it might be best to, to move on at some point if that's also possible. Um, thank you panel. Thanks to Vinita for that question. No, for being, just, um, again, for being so great. Go on, Rudy. Yeah. Yeah, I've got another question from Shelley. Um, Shelley, are you ready to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've recently moved to a fairly newish in growth, a small company from a larger organization um, to set up the well being there. And it's just completely different. Um, and what I don't want to do is come across all corporates and, and put in a strategy proposal, which basically won't fit is there any suggestions on how to gently put in and and how to put that proposal to a startup type smaller company um because i am struggling there's just so much information and i I don't know where to start really i'm i'm thinking what to leave out and what to put in uh yeah i can answer that one um i think you know whenever you go into new business uh and and you're there to maybe drive some change it's really important that you speak to people across the business first to understand what they think might be missing. Because if you speak to leaders and they say we're missing X, Y, Z, you know, manager training on how to deal with, you know, well-being initiatives or, uh, you know, whatever it could be, there's the multiple things they could ask for. And if you've got them saying this is what we're missing, and then you're trying to prioritize what to roll out and you know, what's going to be received well, the things that map across are the things probably to focus on first potentially. And then once you kind of, get some good you know uh good good feelings in the bank because you've been doing what people have been asking for suddenly when you then do another another initiative that maybe the business didn't think they needed you'll um they'll be more receptive to it because they've seen the value you've been able to add already so that's potentially one thing i guess listen listen to what people are asking for and um prioritize accordingly i think well so i have have done a couple of couple of things already but yeah no that's really that's probably a good way to start thank you 
I think to add to that, I did say I moved from a really big like meat manufacturing business to Gusto. And oh my gosh, was it a shock? Like I feel you, Shelley, in terms of like, I was very corporate when I joined Gusto. You know, I'd sign every email off kind of guards, like no emojis, full stops all the time. And then um, it just took somebody to give me feedback to be like, we actually don't do that here. Like we're very like, just use emojis, just be yourself. And that was super empowering for me, but it did feel a bit strange. However, there is value in coming from that corporate background because I imagine the business wants to grow that you're in. And so they will get to that place where actually more processes and and more corporate style things come into play. So I think your experience is super valid and definitely needed. And also you've been hired for a reason, right? Like they they like what you do. So I think have trust in yourself too. Um, There you go. Just a little bit of a pep talk for you. I've been there. It's all good. Uh, Next up, a question from Gavin. Gavin, are you ready to share your question? How about we move on to Melanie? Melanie, are you there? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm not sharing my face. It's 5 a.m. here. (laughs) Wow, Um, thanks for joining (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, working in the startup world, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of startup companies over the years. And, you know, obviously, now that we're, you know, navigating the the uh, great resignation and, you know, still kind of dealing with COVID and all of that, uh, you know, startup companies generally don't have you know, substantial budgets, uh, or interest in investing in, in mental wellness. Um, and they also, you know, all of the employees are just, you know, nose to the grindstone wearing multiple hats. Um, you know, especially now that we're all remote, it's, it's hard to unplug. People are working at midnight, 10 PM on the weekends, Uh, we, you know, here in the States, you know, it's, you know, very, um, you know, just long days, hard work, the work's there. So you got to get it done kind of type thing. And I, I, um, I think, you know, preventing or reducing burnout is important, but in a small company in a startup company, are there any, any things that you guys are seeing trending as ways to prevent burnout or promote wellness, uh, internally? You want to say that, Will? Yeah, I guess a couple of things that I, we can talk to from experience. One that maybe we didn't do so well. So when we kind of first went into the pandemic, my tutor, we kind of knew how important and uh, uh, well-being was going to be at, at a difficult time. So we started rolling out lots of initiatives and, and pushing this across the business. Um, but what we'd sort of failed to do was almost sort of sometimes you have to you can't just assume that someone's going to do something you have to almost like give permission and almost like when there's a shift in culture and you say everyone's working hard nose to the grindstone sometimes you have to kind of almost say that like it's okay to do this so it's not just hey you can go to yoga you can go to this and you can finish at this time you actually kind of have to uh, give people permission almost and say hey this is what we almost want you to do because we had a big a lot of our business was like customer facing and they found it very hard to actually take advantage of some of the things we put on so that was some feedback there, almost giving permission. Um, I think you need leadership to be embodying it as well. So if all the senior leaders of the business are in at six and leaving at 10 and online and on Slack or on the messaging system sharing that, that that culture does um, trickle down. So if you actually want it to, you want people to be sort of, you know, work-life balance, managing managing everything, that, um, time like that, then you need your leaders to do it as well. You need managers to do it. Otherwise, um, people will feel the pressure to do it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that there were like a couple of things that we sort of, um, we learned from, from what, we've, from what we've done, um, so far. Um, James, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think Melanie, you touched on, well, I was hearing something in, in your, in your question, um, just about the inherent stress of a startup environment and, you know, ultimately a startup environment is, creating something new probably that's never been done before with limited resource that's just the nature of of a startup and i think startups are inherently stressful 
um you know that is just they just are you you know something is is being born from the ground up at a fast pace that is just stressful it, it's fast growth people's jobs aren't don't exist anymore people are doing two jobs three jobs there's just you're naturally in an environment where there is just never enough that that's just the, that's just the way it is um and i think an acceptance that that is the case can actually be really powerful just the just the message whether that's from a manager from the ceo just saying look this is how it is like it's it and it's going to be like this now i don't necessarily agree with this but there are you know there's a school of thought that is just yeah this is the way it is um we're a high growth company um that is going to be is going to have a high level of uncertainty and a high level of stress and being really clear about that so people can make a decision whether they're on board for that or not you can hire for that you can mitigate against that by creating providing lots of company support by paying people really well to to um you know to to as a value exchange um, but I think just an acceptance that that is the environment can be can be really powerful. It's when it's when like people then feel the added pressure to do everything they've got to do nine to five and go to yoga for an hour in the day. It can po- even also make people feel worse. So I think um, yeah, I think you know I think sometimes we've just got to accept that startup environments are naturally stressful. Personally, that's not what. I want on what I would sign up for, but certain companies grow at such a rapid rate that that is just naturally the case. Lauren, anything to, any final thoughts to add on that? Yeah, I agree. Like, let's be honest about the situation we're in. Like if you're building something new, that's very hard. Um, Not to get too geeky, but I really like Stephen Covey's circle of control when we talk about stress So actually in a startup environment, you're often empowered to do a lot of things, which is great. But let's think about, okay, let's everything we're worried about or stressed about. Let's put that in one circle. That's everything, right? Inside and outside of work. We've then got a circle, which is what can we influence? So what can we do around us? Who can we speak to to make positive changes in the right direction? And then the most important circle is what you can control. So within all this chaos, what are the rituals you can put into place for yourself to make your life a little bit less stressful in that startup environment? Because let's not forget, like we can have all the greatest companies in the world, but we are responsible also for our own well-being. And there are things that we can do to do that. For example, you could be super strict and say, actually, it's really important to me that I get half an hour during the day to go for a walk. And great, if you have the autonomy to be able to put that in your diary, that's what you can control you unfortunately are less likely to be able to control what management sets for you to do. But if you start focusing on what you can do, um, other people will do the same just from experience. Just picking up Gavin's um, questionnaire since Gavin's driving. Um, How do we influence leaders to move to a culture away from new business profit margins towards a people first culture? Um, Will, do you want to take that first? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think they need, they are necessarily like diametrically opposed. I think you, you can still be a business that, you know, wants to grow fast scale and, and, um, you know, generate revenue, um, and still have a culture that, uh, looks after people, um, and, you know, allows for different people to, to come in, um, and, and work in the business. So I, I don't necessarily think, um, they have to, they have to clash um uh necessarily and but i mean you know in ter- terms of being people uh, people first um and think about people it's just in like the policies you set the ways of working um and you know i, I don't think I, I i kind of i just don't think they necessarily do they do they do um they do clash you know it can be really really fulfilling and enjoying closing new business and and um driving revenue and, and growing something that's amazing i think if you sort of mission driven company um and you're like looking to do good like they can be they can they can work together in quite close harmony i think yeah i, I agree just to add to that i think often you know people think again that people first and driving margins being a separate thing often comes from a place of tick box versus actually if you're adding real value that is having an impact on people feeling 
uh, better about their place in the organization, they feel more productive, and it helps them improve their performance, then that should correlate with improved business performance. And actually, you think two things are aligned when you do it right. It's often what happens is things are being invested in for the sake of investing in it and keeping up appearances. And that's where you end up in a situation where you're, you've got a bunch of initiatives that are not actually driving uh, performance or well-being within the company. But look, Lauren, James, anything to add to that? Um, I think, I w- I think oh, go on, Laura. No, James, you go. Okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> I would just, I would just sort of counter that to, yes, that is true. Uh, they are not mutually exclusive. That's that's a hundred percent true. Yeah, the the fact of the matter is, some companies exist to make money. Like some companies have just been set up, and their sole purpose is to maximize the profit for their shareholders. Like. And at board meetings, they won't be talking about how people are feeling. They'll be talking about, you know, how they can make more money next quarter, or they'll talk about the fact that their industry is being threatened on a macro scale and that they need to survive. So they won't be talking about the health of the company. So, you know, um, having a people first approach is has to be ingrained in the values of the company. That often have, has to happen right at the start in the inception of the business. Now, companies can change, definitely. They can go on big cultural shifts and changes, just like people can change. It's much, much rarer though. Um, And yeah, fundamentally, I just think like we need to be honest that some companies like it's not in their DNA to care about people. It's in their DNA to fulfill the purpose of their business. Um, and yeah, I'd rather us just be honest about that rather than, you know, pretend that every company's there to make us all feel good and make us be happy because they're, they're just not. Some are, um, but uh, I'd say most aren't, if, if I'm being totally honest. Laura? I think, um, I think that's right. I think there are businesses that are designed to make money and that's most businesses, right? Um, for me, I think like shameless plug, Bumble does this really well. So Bumble is a profit-making organization, like it is designed to make money. But when Whitney Wolf Heard started Bumble, right at the beginning, it was always about the people. And so that's been ingrained all the way through. And um, that's why it is the way it is today. It's all about the people. But as a result, you know, we can make money. So that's a great balance. Most companies aren't like that. I think if you look at it, this is when a people team can really come into its own because if you have a really, really strong people team that have a seat at the table at those meetings, that's when you can start to inspire that change and start to show on a strategic level how caring about people will result in more money, basically. So for me, I think it's about having a really strong people team. Fingers crossed, you know, your organizations have chief people officers and my God, they have a hard job in these businesses. But for them, like if they're able to crack into that CEO and and get them to understand why we should care about people, the change can start to happen. Um, And I think a really strong people team is quite often the key to this. Um, This has been an incredible conversation. I could keep going. The questions keep coming in. And and it's obviously, it's not a one and done thing. This is a conversation that will keep going and we'll all learn from each other. Uh, But we are coming to towards the end of the session. And I just want to throw out one one last question to uh, the panel. Um, Around, you know, one of the things we we kind of talk about at How Now is it's not, it's about action, is is actually doing things um, and, and moving the needle. So What's that one thing um, you know, people who are watching and listening to this can do this week uh, to start moving the needle and start moving in the right direction uh, in terms of making mental health a priority in the companies uh, that they work in? What, what's that one thing they can start doing this week? Who wants to take that first? I'm um, happy to. Oh. No, Lauren, you go. <laughs> okay. It's on you this time, Lauren. Our brains work at the same kind of operating capacity. I think we have the same thoughts at the same time. So I think for me, like if there was one thing I could ask you to go and do, it's just to ask the people around you how they are and to care about the answer that they give. Like let's actively listen to what people are saying to us. Let's not just ask how you are 
because you think it's the right thing to do and Lauren's gone and told you to do it. Like, let's listen and try and help those around us and have that community approach to mental health in startups and all other businesses. That for me is like the number one most powerful thing you can do. And I hope you get that in return as well and um, hopefully start a bit of a movement. And you may do that already. So if you already do that, then you're already fantastic. Amazing. James? Yeah, I would say do one thing for your own mental health and then tell someone you work with about it. So whether that's go for a walk, go and do yoga, speak to a coach or a therapist or whatever it is you want to do, um, do that and then tell someone you work with that, that you've done it because that's how we create cultural change around, around mental health and well-being. It's by us taking action and taking responsibility for our own health and well-being and then inspiring others to do the same. So do one thing for you and then tell someone else that you've done it. And Will? This is why I should never go last. The two best <laughs> are gone now. Um, so yeah, completely agree with both of those. Um, I guess, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a people leader, um, make sure you've got a good view on the metrics that we talked about. So you've got a baseline. So, you know, things like turnover, um, whether it's a baseline server that you're, set, you're sending out, like if you can get your metrics in place, then a lot can flow down from there. So we said, you know, the conversations with leadership can then start to happen. You can start tracking progress where you're launching initiatives. Um, so just get a view on those metrics to start, know what you want to track, and then can flow from there. But those other two, I actually think are better than my answer. So uh, do those first. <laughs> uh, well, I loved all of the answers. And, and thank you once again, James, Lauren, and Will, for being an incredible panel and for sharing um, your thoughts and for taking so many questions and for giving up your time um, and for all the work that you do. So thank you once again. Thank you to all of you who joined us and for sending in your questions. Apologies that we didn't get through all of the questions, um, but you know the conversation doesn't have to end here. Um, you can find out the details for all of us uh, in the notes that come out with the show. Feel free to reach out, connect, send your questions in, and we're here um, to help. And please do share in the chat if there are any useful resources, blogs, podcasts, courses, anything that you think would be valuable for the rest of us, then please do stick it in the chat and we will um, collate them together and send it out with the recording of today's session. And like I said, this is the first ever L&D Disrupt Line. Um, so we may have done some things right. We may have done some things wrong. Uh, there's only one way to find out is if you will let us know. We have a bit of feedback. Just let us know what you'd like to see, what we could have done better. And, and hopefully we can continuously learn and continuously improve how we do this. And a quick shout out for the next installment of LND uh, Disrupt Live, uh, which will be all about your kind of how your first 90 days and how to make a meaningful impact in your organization within the first 90 days of joining. And we're joined by two incredible uh, panelists who will be sharing their insights, their experiences on how to do that. The um, event will be taking place on the 1st of February at 11 a.m. GMT. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you once again. And until next time, have a good one. <laughs>